Um, I shall first start to introduce myself a little bit more, and also I want to tell you that if if you want to interrupt me, you you are um, allowed to do that. If you don't understand what I'm talking about or have some questions for clarification, um, a few years ago when I worked with um, Amnesty International. Um, When I worked with Amnesty International Refugee Department in the Netherlands, I wrote an article on lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex LGBTI asylum seekers. And uh, through the interference of COC Netherlands, the Dutch National LGBT Organization, uh, the, the I, they didn't, uh, they didn't um, incorporate yet in their name, but will not take very long, I think, before they will. Um, they, uh, the, 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 my article led to parliamentary questions and to an improvement in Dutch policy. Um, and after another improvement, I thought this might be interesting for other European countries as well. But I had no idea how the situation was in, um, in those countries. So then I contacted uh, Thomas Pijkerboer, professor in migration law at VU University Amsterdam, we applied for a European grant and we got the grant and we carried out the fleeing homophobia research on the legal situation of LGBTI asylum seekers in Europe based on data supplied by experts from 25 European countries. Uh, the report fleeing homophobia asylum claims related to sexual orientation and gender identity in Europe was launched in 2011 and translated into 10 languages, among which Spanish. Um, it was the first comprehensive European study on the subject. I did this research on behalf of CUC Netherlands and together with Thomas Pijkerboer and several national uh, and other experts. Later, I was involved in the cases of the Dutch prelim preliminary questions on the handling of LGBTI asylum cases to the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg. Um, last year, I performed research for ILGA Europe on good practices related to LGBTI asylum claims in the EU, which was not translated into Spanish. Um, each year, thousands of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex asylum seekers apply for international protection in Europe. They come from all parts of the world and they flee persecution by the state or by fellow citizens. In 1981, the Netherlands acknowledged that sexual orientation can be a persecution ground and that homosexuals can be members of a so-called particular social group in the sense of the Refugee Convention. The European Union codified this insight in 2004 in the Qualification Directive, and since 2011, gender identity is also explicitly mentioned in this directive. In Spain, explicit reference is made to sexual orientation and gender identity in the Ley de Asilo of 2009, and this is a good practice. However, in the fleeing homophobia research, we also found Spanish practices that we could not exactly label as good practices. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we found that in most European states, international protection was in fact granted to LGBTI asylum seekers. Although from Spain was reported that refugee status in LGBTI cases was, with a few exceptions, only granted to LGBTI activists. Um, we found several specific problems surrounding these cases and several differences in the way in which European states deal with these issues. Uh, I will discuss four problems, criminalization, discretion, credibility, and uh, coming out late in some detail later. And at the same time, I will address the recent European case law regarding these topics. But first, I will mention some issues which apply to other asylum seekers as well but which can have a particularly harsh impact on LGBTI asylum seekers. And then first we have the state protection, uh, because most LGBTI asylum seekers flee 
violence from by fellow citizens, family, friends, employers, gangs, neighbors, in the street, in the workplace, etc., etc. It is important to know whether state protection in the country of origin is available for LGBTI people. Um, in countries where sexual orientation is a crime, state protection will not, never be available. Um, although the Fleeing Homophobia Report found that in Spain in 2010-2011, seek, seeking state protection was even expected in countries that criminalize homosexuality. I, I hope that this is, this is um, history now. Um, uh, and there are also in many other countries where people flee from where the authorities are so homophobic or transphobic that it's an illusion to think that they would provide protection against anti-LGBTI violence. And then there is the internal flight alternative. Sometimes claimants are told to move to another part of the country of origin. Um, and this could mean for LGBTI claimants that he or she has to go into hiding in the new location. Um, and then there is the, the, the discrimination, of, discrimination of LGBTI people, which will often amount to persecution. Um, and this was, uh, again, according to the Fleeing Homophobia Report, hardly acknowledged by the Spanish authorities. Um, and in Spain, persecution by non-state actors was usually labeled as discrimination only, and no asylum was granted. Then there is the country of origin information, which is a, a very important condition for a well-informed decision in all cases, but also in LGBTI asylum cases. Um, is good and up-to-date country of origin information. And in addition, this should be used in a proper way, uh, which was, again, reportedly not always done by the Spanish asylum authorities. Um, and then there are, of course, also specific challenges regarding the reception of LGBTI asylum seekers, um, especially because they are often alone and they sometimes fear asylum seekers from their own country. Um, okay, then I start to talk about the criminalization. Um, and, and there are still 75 countries in the world where one risks being arrested and detained or even sentenced to death for consensual same-sex sexual activity. Um, uh, criminal provisions prohibit, for example, acts against the order of nature or sexual acts between males. And in several of these states, lesbian sex is not explicitly outlawed and neither is gender identity. However, it can be assumed that in countries explicitly prohibi prohibiting male-male sexual acts, uh, lesbians, bisexual women, and trans and intersex people will risk persecution by the state as well. As an LGBTI person living in such a country, one always risks being arrested by the state authorities and at the same time risk violence and discrimination by fellow citizens, which will go unpunished. In short, criminalization makes LGBTIs into outlaws at risk of persecution or serious harm all the time. The conclusion of the fleeing homophobia research regarding criminalization was that refugee status should be granted to all lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex applicants fleeing countries where sexual orientation or gender identity are criminalized. Currently, this is also the opinion of Amnesty International and the International Commission of Jurists. However, Italy is the only country in Europe where this idea is put into practice. In Italy, we found a circumstance that an LGB, LGB person originates from, they didn't find trans people, originates from a country where sexual orientation is criminalized, is regarded as sufficient evidence to grant this person asylum. Whether or not the criminal law is enforced is not an issue in Italian practice. And at the same time, Spain was one of the countries in the fleeing homophobia research where even the existence of enforced criminalization in the country of origin was considered insufficient. For recognition as a refugee, it was required that applicants show that there are indications that prosecution will take place in their specific case. 
which I also would hope and expect that this is history. Um, then there is the discretion, and in large parts of the world, people hide or conceal their sexual orientation or gender identity. Gender identity. They stay in the closet because they fear harm from others, um, state authorities, family members, friends, neighbors, or society in general. Um, LGBTI people who flee their country and reply for international protection in Europe were often rejected with the reasoning that they have nothing to fear in their country of origin as long as they remain discreet. They are explicitly or implicitly required to hide their sexual orientation or gender identity in order to prevent persecution. We found in 2011 at least that in 2011 at least 17 European states sent LGBTI asylum seekers back into the closet. Spain was one of them. However, several jurisdictions outside Europe have had rejected then already this discretion requirement. Also, UNHCR rejects the idea, <laughs> for instance, in their guidelines number nine. Um, in 2010, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom ruled in a landmark judgment called H.J. Iran, H.T. Cameroon, that gay men should be able to live freely and openly. The test that was previously applied, the so-called reasonable tolerability test that held that it would be reasonable tolerable to expect people to hide their sexual orientation upon return was rejected in this judgment. Uh, the judgment contains a new test on how to handle LGBTI asylum claims. When an, when an, an asylum applicant um, comes to the UK, um, the first question is, is the applicant gay? And, 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 and uh, claims asylum for, for being gay. <laughs> The first question is, is the applicant in fact gay or would he be perceived as gay in the country of origin? If the answer to this question is yes, then the next question would be, would gay people who live openly um, be liable to persecution in that country where the person is coming from? If the answer to this question is also yes, the people would be, he is gay and and he would be liable to persecution upon return turn to his country of origin. Then the next question is, what are his plans? Would he live openly on return when we sent him back? Um, if he would, then he is a refugee, because that's too dangerous. If, but if he would live discreetly, then the next question would be, why would he live discreetly? In, in, in my opinion, they, they should stop questioning. They should say if, if he would live openly on return, then he is a refugee in this, this. Here it should stop. Someone has a question? No. Um, so they, they, in, they want to know about his plans, what, what he w w is planning to do. And if he says, um, when you send me back to my country of origin, I will live discreetly. Um, then, and then they say, why? And I say, it would be out of fear of persecution. Then, then he is a refugee. But if he says, if you send me back to my country of origin, I will live discreetly, not because of fear of persecution, but because of societal pressure and not wanting to distress his parents, then he is not a refugee. So the main problem with this test, this British test, is that in a homophobic environment, it's not possible to distinguish between the reasons why someone is in the closet and if it is, it is out of fear of persecution or out of societal pressure. This, this will be um, um, intertwined. In addition, it's always possible that this part of voluntary discretion, the sexual orientation, will be discovered. Nevertheless, Scandinavian countries, Norway, Finland, Sweden, have adopted this uh, British uh, approach of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. So there they also ask why, what are your plans when we send you back, and if you live discreetly, why would you live discreetly, and if you say it's because out of societal pressure, then 
we reject your asylum application. Um, the discretion requirement tends to be very flexible and also very persistent. It has been compared to a mutating virus. Once you think you got rid of it, it comes back in another form. For instance, in the Netherlands in 2007, a new policy rule stated that it would no longer be expected of asylum seekers to hide their sexual orientation upon return. But a few years later, the policy changed and discretion was introduced again. It was then considered acceptable to require some restraint in the expression of the sexual orientation, as long as this expression was meaningful. <coughs> and the Dutch authorities considered it a meaningful expression of sexual orientation whenever the person concerned finds a way to practice sex, while they also thought it, it would be fine that this would be kept a secret towards all others. Um, in an attempt to end this confusion, in April 2012, the Dutch Council of State asked for guidance by means of so-called preliminary questions from the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg. In the cases of three gay men from Senegal, Sierra Leone and Uganda, the question was whether concealment or restraint regarding sexual orientation could be required and if so, to what extent. The Court answered in November 2003 in the judgment X, Y, and Z versus Minister for Immigratie and Asyl, that neither concealment nor restraint of sexual orientation can be required. For this would be incompatible with the recognition of a characteristic so fundamental to a person's identity that the person concerned cannot be required to renounce it. And the fact that he could avoid the risk by exercising greater restraint than a heterosexual in expressing his sexual orientation is not be taken into account. This answer was not a big surprise because earlier the court answered in a similar manner to questions from the German Supreme Court, the Bundesverwaltungsgericht, regarding concealment of religion. That an Ahmadi Muslim from Pakistan can avoid a real risk of persecution by abstaining from relig certain religious practices is in principle irrelevant, the court then um, uh, ruled. It's no surprise either that as a result of the XYZ judgment, the Dutch policy has changed. Instead of reasoning from the idea that people could hide their sexual orientation or gender identity, the new policy assumes that the sexual identity becomes known in the country of origin. The new yardstick is what will happen as a result. Can the applicant live as an LGBT person without the fear of persecution? And I think this is progress. Um, the Council of State also asked the Court of Justice, Justice whether the existence of criminal provisions against homosexuality in, uh, would constitute an act of persecution. The answer was no. The mere existence of legislation criminalizing homosexual acts cannot be regarded as an act of persecution, the court said. However, the court did acknowledge that a term of imprisonment which sanctions homosexual acts and which is actually applied in the country of origin must be regarded as being a punishment which is disproportionate and discriminatory and thus constitutes an act of, persecu an act of persecution as well as an infringement of the right to privacy. In my opinion, the conclusion could be drawn that whenever there's evidence that someone has been detained based on a provision against homosexuality or homosexual acts, refugee status must be granted to all other LGBTIs who fled this same country. And also the Committee Against Torture considered, considered in 2011 already in a Swedish case that the argument that Bangladeshi authorities are not actively per persecuting homosexuals does not rule out as, that such a prosecution can occur. Or this case called Utal Mondal versus Sweden uh, um, um, uh, supports this uh, opinion of mine. Um, then there is the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, who has a different approach. In 
1981, the court considered that the provision criminalizing same-sex sexual acts um, in Northern Ireland was a violation of the right to privacy protected in Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights in the case Dudgeon, and the similar judgments were regarding um, um, Ireland and Cyprus uh, some years later, and in these cases, the uh, European Court on Human Rights spoke of the detrimental effects of the Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, the court uh, the, the found the, the spoke of the detrimental effects of the very existence of the provisions which they can have on the life of a person of homosexual orientation and found the mere criminalization sufficient <coughs> for the conclusion that the right to private life protected in Article 8 of the Convention um, was violated. However, in the first gay asylum ca case, cases before the European Court of Human Rights, called uh, F versus United Kingdom and IIN versus the Netherlands, both in 2004, and both concerning gay men from Iran, the court decided that the fact that the country to which the applicant is to be removed, Iran, will violate his right to respect to private life by the criminalization of his sexual orientation does not imply that he cannot be expelled to that country. So apparently um, human rights are not universal as the court makes a distinction between the human rights of Europeans and those of asylum seekers. Um, and regarding the discretion requirement, the Strasbourg Court in 2004 in these cases assumes that the two Iranians, Mr. F and Mr. I, I N, could conceal their sexual orientation upon return to Iran. Um, recently, the European Court of Human Rights explicitly ruled on the issue of concealing, explicitly ruled on the issue of concealing sexual orientation as well, but with a different outcome than the Court of Justice in XYZ. In the case ME versus Sweden, the court's majority judged that a Libyan gay man could return to Libya in order to apply for a family reunion with his partner. And the court saw no problem in the fact that he had to hide his sexual orientation there. For in this case, the discretion would only be temporarily and then there was a dissenting opinion in this case formulated by Judge Power Ford, who considered that the judgment was not um, in line with the, <coughs> the judgment of the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. Um, <coughs> she didn't agree with the new test of duration that, that um, is not found elsewhere in other European law. <coughs> and then in, in November 2014, the court um, uh, uh, announced that they would, they would refer the complaint of Mr. M.E. To, um, to the Grand Chamber but um, a month later, the Swedish Migration Board decided to grant Mr. M.E. a permanent resident permit, permit, which is, of course, nice for Mr. M.E., <coughs> but bad for the development of law. And the court chose not to proceed with the case. So there it stopped. The last judgment, uh, judgment I will discuss is A, B, and C versus Staatssecretaris van Veiligheid en Justitie about three men from Afghanistan, Gambia, and Uganda versus the Netherlands, and they all said they were gay, but the Netherlands didn't believe this. Um, following the questions in the XYC cases, the Dutch Council of State asked the EU Court of Justice what limits are drawn by the Qualification Directive and by the EU Charter of um, Fundamental Rights, um, specifically Article 3 and 7, regarding the way in which the credibility of a state that sexual orientation is assessed. And Article 3 of the Charter protects the right to the physical and mental integrity, and Article 7, the respect to private and family life. Um, 
There are two reasons why this is an important question. Firstly, the number of lesbian, gay, and bisexual asylum seekers who are rejected because their stated sexual orientation is not believed is growing. Um, the Australian Jenny Milbank described in her article in 2009, the article called From Discretion to Disbelief, the trend that in countries where practice becomes more sensitive towards LGBTI applicants, the reasons for rejecting asylum claims shift from arguments based on discretion to not believing that the applicant is an LGBT or I person. And this trend occurs in Europe as well. A few years ago, I hardly saw cases in which the sexual orientation was not believed. Whereas nowadays, rejections based on incredibility of sexual orientation are very common. I guess an estimate in the Netherlands, it's about 50%. Um, uh, secondly, in European member states, there is a huge second reason why it's an important question. <laughs> um, in European member states, there's a huge diversity in the way asylum authorities assess someone's sexual orientation. Uh, in some states, self-identification is the general means by which sexual orientation or gender identity is assessed, while in other states, different members of the medical profession are consulted in order to carry out this assessment. Uh, there is the highly controversial practice of phallometry, a method that has been applied in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia in asylum cases to prove sexual orientation by measuring the applicant's physical reactions while watching different types of porn pornograph pornographic material. And an intrusive and degrading practice that was suspended in the Czech Republic in 2009. Um, in addition, in several countries, we found other medical examinations by psychologists, psychiatrists, and sexologists used to assess sexual orientation of asylum seekers. However, sexual orientation should not be treated as a medical category, and neither should gender identity. <coughs> in addition, there are many stereotypes in this assessment. Often, asylum seekers are questioned on gay life or gay culture in the country of origin and in the country of asylum, questions which can lead to rejections when the answers do not match the stereotypical assumption on how a true LGBT or I person behaves. Um, asylum authorities sometimes ask very detailed and explicit questions on sexual acts. For instance, how many people did you have sex with? What did you do exactly when you had sex? How many people, oh no, no, sorry, <laughs> how, did you, <laughs> how did you feel while having sex? Um, <laughs> because of the increasing pressure to prove their sexual identity, in the United Kingdom, gay men, turn, gay men turn to extraordinary methods of proof, including filming themselves while having sex. Um, one of the conclusions of the fleeing homophobia research was as a general principle, establishing sexual orientation or gender identity should be based on self-identification of the applicant. And um, at the same time, we thought we could rid, get rid of these stereotypes by means of LGBTI sensitivity trainings for asylum authorities. However, although I think these type of trainings are very important because asylum practice shows that rejections of LGBTI asylum applicants are often based on a lack of understanding of concepts like being in the closet and coming out of it, and I it, think it's a very good practice that the European Asylum Support Office issued a training module on gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. I am still afraid that sensitivity trainings will not provide a real solution. Because when we prepared the ABC case, we reached the conclusion that it's simply not possible to assess someone else's sexual orientation in an objective way. <clears throat> and when Asylum authorities try to do such an assessment, um, stereotypes are inevitable. And it's therefore not strange that we found so many stereotypes in asylum decisions. In other words, uh, assessing the credibility of sexual orientation or gender identity is always based on stereotypes and subjective notions. So the only way to assess a sexual orientation or gender identity 
would be to ask the person concerned or to base the assessment of the sexual orientation on the declaration of the asylum seekers. As also the Yogyakarta principle state, each person's self-defined sexual orientation and gender identity is integral to their personality and is one of the most basic aspects of self-determination, dignity and freedom. However, in the judgment A, B and C, the EU Court of Justice did not follow our point of view. According to the court, the sole declaration of the applicant is not sufficient to establish the sexual orientation. Uh, the, this declaration constitutes merely the starting point of the assessment that can be verified. But according to the court, there are three methods of assessing sexual orientation which the court does not allow. One, the assessment should not be based only on stereotype notions concerning homosexuals. Two, there should be no detailed questions as to the sexual practices of the applicant. Three, evidence such as the performance of homosexual acts should not be accepted, nor submission to tests to establish homosexuality or film, films of homosexual acts. In the United Kingdom, a lot has changed since, since this moment when an applicant now tells her or his story on sexual orientation in a sexual explicit way, the interviewer should now say, stop please, I'm not going to ask you any detailed questions about sex. I do not want to stop you from giving us your story, but if you talk about your sex life, I will not be following up your statements with questions which ask you for further sexual detail. You need to know that we do not consider descriptions of this detail of physical sexual activity as providing evidence of your sexuality. Okay, then a short word of on coming out late, because asylum seekers, uh, asylum seekers are supposed to tell their story at the first occasion, but LGBTI people may have various reasons why they do not disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity in the first asylum interview. <laughs> because they may feel ashamed, they may suffer from internalized homophobia, they may be afraid other people find out, they may not have fully come out yet, or they may not be aware that sexual orientation or gender identity is a ground for asylum. This has often led to a coming out in a later procedure and a rejection of their asylum claim. <clears throat> and now in the ABC judgment, the court ruled that it should not be considered that the statements lack credibility merely because the applicant did not tell about his sexual orientation at the first occasion he was given to do so. Um, and it's still, it's important how the judgment is interpreted in the national legislations. I don't know the reaction to ABC in Spain, and I would like to learn it, it but it took the Dutch Council of State nine months to give an interpretation of the judgment of the answers to their own questions. And according to the Council of State, the minister should clarify now how the assessment of a sexual orientation is done, what kind of questions are being asked, and how the answers to these questions are weighed. Um, <clears throat> they, they think that, in general, the Dutch minister uh, uh, remains within the limits of European law in investigating the credibility of sexual orientation but they should explain how they do the assessment in specific cases and, uh, and they should make a policy or an established or there is no policy or established pra practice in which the, the, the Secretary of State, the Minister, uh, investigates and assess the alleged sexual orientation. And it's therefore not possible for a judge to assess whether the decision of the Minister is effective. So the Secretary of State should draft a new policy, and that's what they did. Recently, the 1st of October, our Secretary of State, our Minister, made a new uh, policy with the focus on questions in, on the own experience of the applicant, how the surroundings reacted to the sexual orientation, how the situation of the LGBT people in the country of origin is, and, um, and how the experiences of the person fit in the general picture. Uh, but the minister, when the people come from a country where the sexual orientation or gender identity is not accepted, which is often the case, of course, the Secretary of State 
expects a process of realization in which the applicant will be confronted with the issue of what it means for him to be different compared to society's expectations. And this is also reflected in Dutch case law. So in a recent case, a man from Iran was not believed to be gay. And when he was questioned about the inner process of realization of his sexual orientation, he answered that he himself felt fine with his sexual orientation, although he found it hard that he had to hide it from his family and his, and his surroundings. Uh, the, immigration, the Dutch immigration authorities were of the opinion that his answers were superficial and lacked emotional depth, and they rejected his application. And this is a general practice in the Netherlands nowadays. However, he won his appeal because the court thought that the method of assessing was not very clear, which I agree. My conclusion of ABC is that it's positive that this judgment excludes some methods of assessing sexual orientation, and it's also positive that the prob problems regarding coming out late are dealt with. However, the problem that the asylum applications of many lesbian, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals are being, being rejected because their sexual orientation is not believed, while these decisions are based on stereotypes or misconceptions, the problem, this problem is not solved yet. Thank you for your attention, and I would like to hear about Spanish practice. <laughs>
Volia fer diverses qüestions molt breus. El 2009, jo com a president d'una entitat LGBT d'aquí a Catalunya, vaig estar treballant amb ILGA, a Europa, sobre uns protocols per als funcionaris de les delegacions diplomàtiques de tots els països europeus de com es tenia de tractar el ciutadà d'un país tercer quan anava a la seva ambaixada o consolat a demanar informació sobre el tema de refugiat donat que s'havia produït casos, sobretot en Polònia, en què eren expulsats directament de les ambaixades o dels llocs on anaven a informar-se. I és clar, veig que tota aquesta informació que vam donar als funcionaris sobre com es tenia de tractar el col·lectiu LGBT, veig que encara està molt perdut perquè hi ha molta subjectivitat per part del funcionari que té la persona que no és activista i que no va a través de padrinar d'una tercera d'una tercera persona o d'una tercera agrupació estrangera que li faci el padrinat. I després una cosa que estic veient. Estem vivint ara una realitat que estem aquí parlant d'una sèrie de temes quan Europa literalment està donant l'esquena a tot el tema dels refugiats per motius de guerra, ja no només per temes d'orientació. Fa uns 15 dies la canceller Merkel va tenir la catxassa, diguem-ho així, per ser amb fins, d'acceptar una futura incorporació de Turquia a la Unió Europea i així donava bon tracte als refugiats que estan fugint de Síria. Turquia fa molts anys, quan es va voler fer la petició d'incorporació a la Unió Europea, precisament dintre del grup de treball, que en aquell moment estava el Rul Robeva en l'àmbit LGBT del Parlament Europeu, va fer l'observació sobre el tractament del col·lectiu LGBT a Turquia. A Turquia, sobretot el col·lectiu transsexual, hi ha grups policials que es dediquen a fer assassinats de referents activistes, tot i que són gent reconeguda, etc. I per part de la Unió Europea no són tractats ni són acollits. Un altre cas també és el cas de Camerún. David Cato, un mes abans de ser assassinat, també va anar a Roma, va demanar, i a la Unió Europea sempre hi ha una tancada en molts temes d'aquests. Clar, aquests són activistes, però fins a quin punt un ciutadà que està totalment aïllat en un país islàmic, etc., etc., com pot ser que arribi a un lloc com és Europa i se li tracti correctament, cosa que en aquest moment no es fa. Gràcies. Per a la següent pregunta pediré un poc de brevedat, perquè si no, no comerem el torn de pregunta. Interesting questions. I, 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 I'm not sure I, I have answers here. <laughs> um. <laughs> Do you maybe have an answer here? No, because I couldn't understand the question. Oh. So. Lo siento, no, yo no Of course, that's complicated. And, and yes, yes, the, 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 the trans, transgender people are uh, persecuted in Turkey. I agree. Uh, um, and, and at the same time, there are uh, uh, two million uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. Um, yeah. No, uh, yo más que nada era saber exactamente cómo se puede coordinar una respuesta europea para esta situación que se está viviendo. Europa siempre se ha vendido la marca de zona protectora de derechos humanos y en cambio en este momento no es una zona que sea acogedora en el ámbito de derechos humanos cuando son países terceros. Eh, en el ámbito LGBT, si son activistas ya hay mucha dificultad, hay asesinatos. Si una persona es un civil individual en un país islámico, por ejemplo, lo único que puede suceder es que esa persona, lo más seguro, cuando se ponga en evidencia que quiere un refugio, sea aniquilado ya sea civilmente o ya sea físicamente. Por tanto, ¿cómo se puede coordinar políticas europeas 
ante esta reacción, que no sé, eh, sabemos cómo funciona Europa, pero es de, totalmente de vergüenza. Gracias. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer here, I'm sorry. En principio, bueno, ¿hay alguna otra pregunta? Does, can someone tell me anything about Spanish practice towards uh, LGBTI asylum seekers in the last years? <laughs> I will talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Muy bien. Eh, continuamos entonces con Juan Carlos. <laughs> 